The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us here on a lovely Tuesday afternoon. My name is Dan Carney. I work at the Seattle campus of Northeastern University as a recruiter, and I'm joined by Dr. Chris Unger, a faculty member in the Graduate School of Education. He's going to discuss the Doctorate of Education, uh, as well as uh, we're joined by Melissa Widman, who is a current student in the program. I will now turn it over to Chris, and uh, please, everyone, if you'd like to uh, fire a question in the uh, chat session, and uh, I or Melissa or Chris will answer it. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, thanks, Dan. So Chris Unger here. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and I want to thank uh, Melissa for joining us. She'll obviously correct me later and let me know that uh, she goes by Missy. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, we want to just kind of quickly go over the, the program um, and uh, try to leave some room for a few questions and answers and conversation afterwards. So we'll try to go through this relatively quickly. So Dan, if you would move to the next slide. Okay, um, so I'm Chris Unger. We'll tell a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit about each of us. Um, I've been teaching the Doctor of Education program at Northeastern University since 2010, uh, and I have enjoyed it immensely. Um, one of the things that you'll hear about is that the focus of our program is about you being a change agent in the world, as idealistic as that sounds, that's what we believe, that our students are doing what they can to make a difference in the world in the ways that they want to make a difference in the world. And so I've had the uh, pleasure of working with how many? I'm going to say with at least 800 doctoral students in the last eight years. Um, and as you'll hear later too, we have a fairly significantly sizable doctoral program with over 1,600 students, uh, not just nationally, but internationally as well. Um, my particular focus and interest is on innovation and entrepreneurial activity in education. Um, so I go around the country and the world, in fact, just got back from China a month ago, on looking at innovative teaching, learning, and schooling practices and, um, you know, um, and supporting our educators um, and our students to think about how they can move the needle in education, primarily in the K-12, but also higher education and communities. So that's a little bit about me, Missy. Yeah, I've been teaching for almost 20 years in the area of health and fitness at secondary level. And I connected about four years ago with a cognitive learning scientist, and it really changed the way that I think about education. So we've been working together for four years, and we started a nonprofit called Neural Education and realized that um, in order for us to to have a, a bigger social impact, um, we needed to really start doing some research on the, the strategies that other educators were co-creating with us. And so that is where um, I learned about Northeastern and their experiential learning program. That is why I'm here. Thanks, and Dan. My name is Dan Carney. I've worked for Northeastern for the past couple of years uh, here at the Seattle campus. Northeastern, uh, based in Boston, has expanded its reach across the continent. Uh, we have campuses in California, Charlotte, Seattle, Toronto, and we're opening one in Vancouver. Uh, Charlotte and Seattle offer the, the EDD program. Uh, at, those are the two successful uh, regional campuses for that. We also obviously offer it uh, in Boston. Uh, but I will be the point of contact for anyone who would like to have information regarding requirements. Uh, if anyone lives in the Seattle area and wants to take a tour of the campus, come on down and see what we offer here in the South Lake Union neighborhood. Uh, my information will be uh, distributed later. Uh, for that and, and basically uh, any questions that you might need answered, I can either answer them or put you in touch with the appropriate resource. Excellent. Okay, so let's talk about the program. So we'll go to the next slide here. There's a little bit of a delay on my end, I think. So 
So uh, I'm going to try to do this really quickly. Uh, our program, as I had said before, is really about you making a difference in the world. Um, in fact, one of the things I like, one of our, uh, when I teach on the Seattle campus, which I do frequently, um, I usually invite current students and alum to come meet the new cohort. And one of the students a couple of years ago um, said something that has stuck with me since. And she said that this is a narcissistic program. And I thought that was wonderful <laughs> because um, it truly is about what you're trying to do and what you're trying to do to make a difference in the world, whether it's in your nonprofit, for profit, uh, K through 12 setting, higher ed setting. Um, we also have people in the military. I've had nurse practitioners uh, in the program. I had a hospital administrator who was in charge of all the professional development in the hospital. And so that's another thing that's really interesting about our program is that when you hear doctor of education, people sometimes default to it being K through 12 or a higher ed only. But we have, as I said, we have, we have students uh in all all different areas of work in the world and um i would say about 40 percent are k through 12. i would say another 30 35 percent are in higher ed another 25 or 30 percent roughly are in organizers leadership so we'll talk about that a little bit later but it's really about how you can interact and engage others in the world to kind of support the kinds of changes that you think um are um, uh, you know important um, basically for our society and for our humanity and again it sounds idealistic but that's what we embrace um, so let me go to the next slide and I'll have Missy chime in in a little bit but I want to kind of give you the details um, I've spoken to some of these items already but you being a change agent which is um, not always easy, which is one of the re reasons I think that this program is really interesting is because it gives you a space and place and community, faculty and fellow students to actually think about, well, how do, how do I make change in the world? And it has to be around something that is meaningful to you. It's not about us um, putting or giving or handing out or uh, particular information or knowledge that we believe is most important, but for us to facilitate helping you think about what is the difference you're trying to make and what are the resources and ways that we can help you do that. We focus on you being a scholar practitioner. So we're not trying to train you to be researchers or even lecturers at universities. We're actually working with those who are on the ground, whether they could be student affairs people in higher ed or community college vice presidents or deans, uh, principals, uh, di district leaders, nonprofit leaders, um, or hospitals, uh, people in the military. The question is, how can you actually leverage theory and research to make the difference that you're intending to make? Um, and in that case, it's we talk about you really um, building knowledge that's local in particular to your context so you know you would be zooming in on your particular community or your organization um that you're really trying to have the impact so it's not so just generalizable knowledge but specific knowledge to how you can apply what you know and what you're learning to make a difference in the world and and of course um i think one of the highlights to this and i'll add have missy add to any of this in a second here is that um, as I mentioned, we have over 1,600 doctoral students. I would say 40% or 45% are in the New England East Coast area. The rest are across the country. And we have about 4% that are international. I've had students in Ecuador, India, Japan, um, the Philippines. Um, and we're just starting to... Um, have conversations with a number of educators in China about their interest in the program. So that's my broad overview. But Missy, you want to add anything to this this slide that is you feel yeah. resonates with you? Yeah. Yeah, and I was looking at several programs for about a two-year period of time, and I had some options on where to go. And when it came down to it, the reason that I chose Northeastern over a couple of other universities was because of the fact that one, it's experiential, and two, you overlay your research with your 
with your programming. So a lot of schools, what they do is you take all of your courses in succession, and then when you're done with those courses, then you start your research. The nice thing about Northeastern is you start thinking about your research day one, and every class that you take supports you in that research. So it's not just you uh, reading about other people's research to figure out how to do your own. You're actually, it's experiential, so you're actually doing your research with the guidance of different professors along the way with a different lens from every course. Yes. Excellent. Let's go to the next slide. So, I mentioned some of this already. This focus is on lead, you leading and doing change in your community. And uh, Missy kind of uh, foregrounded this a little bit. Um, you engage it um, in cycles of action research. So, instead of saying we're preparing you to be a change agent, like in three or four years up the road, we're saying, okay, you probably are in some ways already a change agent, but let's continue that journey and be more deliberate about the kinds of moves and actions that you take to really make the difference that you want to make as a change agent in, in the world. So we engage you in this, um, these cycles of action research, which then really comprise your, what we call your dissertation or practice. Um, I'll get more into this more later, but you're not writing a 200 page, five chapter traditional thesis at the end but you are actually engaging in sort of the actions you want to take to make a difference in the community you work in. And that becomes the basis of your dissertation and practice. Um, do you want to say what you're working on, Missy? Sure. Um, I am working on uh, connecting neuroscience to teaching and learning, so bridging the gap between what neuroscientists know about the brain and the strategies and practices that we do in the classroom as teachers. So I am working with a cognitive learning scientist, um, like I said before, and then I also, there are several um, professors that are very interested in neuroscience and cognition at Northeastern. And what I'm studying is I'm studying the shift in educator attitudes when they learn the, the neuroscience behind learning and the neuroscience behind behavior. Right. So in, the, in, in a traditional program, you might have been taking a series of courses and then three years later, you might be undertaking a study and then you would sort of publish your thesis, 200 page thesis on your study, but instead, you're probably interacting with a variety of people around that topic, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm definitely growing the network. From day one, I started growing my network versus, you know, waiting till the end when you start your dissertation at the end. Yeah, great. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Dan. So there are, um, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit more later, but I will talk about, um, uh, talk about the concentrations, which I already referred to, but um, the curriculum, teaching, learning, and leadership, these are the three concentrations right now, the curriculum, teaching, learning, and leadership, the concentration. Uh, some people um, assume that's K through 12, but in fact, curriculum, teaching, learning, and leadership happens in higher ed and in communities like the Boys and Girls Club, and so forth and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, it could in, in the hospital administrator. It also, curriculum, uh, teaching, learning, and leadership is a, a big highlight in how you provide professional development to a large organization. So that is a concentration. But um, if you're in higher ed and you're particularly interested in administration or the legal environment or how to undertake student affairs um, activities and so forth and so on and manage uh, manage a higher institution. Uh, a lot of higher ed people will take that concentration and the courses in that are, are geared to those type of endeavors. And then we have organizational leadership studies and um, you know, that's about how you make change in organizations which uh, uh, for those of you who are in organizations uh, probably can recognize that uh, that that's always not that's not always an easy endeavor uh, no matter how how much people are devoted to trying to um, be innovative or, or steer in different directions or keep up with the world of work as we know it now. Uh, leading organizations is a, is a, is a difficult task. Um, interesting side note, I had a, um, a, 
newly appointed college president called me a couple of years ago and he was asking, well, which of these concentrations would I go, would I go into higher ed? And I said, well, after a long conversation with him, uh, you know, came to the conclusion that he's actually leading a large organization. So for him as a newly appointed college president, it would probably be more appropriate and probably to be engaged in the organizational leadership concentration. So um, I will say that we're also developing a suite of courses um, that run across these concentrations around experiential learning, which Northeastern is probably most well known for, as well as education entrepreneurship, which is how do you actually pursue innovation in, in K through 12 in higher ed systems and communities. Um, so those are also some things that we're offering in the coming year. Let's go to the next slide, Dan. So, um, as Missy referenced, she's already engaging in her research. She's building her network. She's interacting with faculty. She's reaching out to other faculty. And um, another important point I like to say is that given the nature of our program and the working professionals that are in our program, uh, I think that I, I always say in my classes in particular that I hope that that the students are learning as much from one another as they are from me because there's a lot of the, the students that are in the program are one of the things that I love the most about it. I mean, these are not young 23 or 24 year olds. These are people at least in their mid thirties up until I've had a student who was in his early eighties. <laughs> um, they run the gamut. They uh, often have positions and responsibilities where working full time doesn't mean just 40 hours a week. It means 50 or 60 hours a week. And often they have family, they have little ones at home. And so, um, you know, that's another interesting attribute of our program is just learning from the fellow students. But back to the dissertation for supervisor. In a lot of programs, you might get a thesis advisor, again, at the end of your coursework and undertake your study. But in this program, you actually end up getting your dissertation supervisor in the second quarter of the program. And you work um, hand in hand uh, closely with that supervisor. It is your research. So it's not heavy hand, it's not the supervisor's research. Actually our role and my role as a dissertation supervisor is to really help my advisees figure out what it is that they really wanna do, what is the difference they really wanna make, and then sort of coach, support, and engage as a thought partner in how they can actually go about doing that. So I think that is a big difference um, in the program as well. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Missy? Um, yeah, having the dissertation supervisor in the second course really helps you. You have that one person that you can talk to all the time. And I know for me, my supervisor, every time I talk to her, she knows my research inside and out. So you have the other professors that are there to give you a different lens on it. But then you have the professor that's, um, that really understands your research and has read every word of your um, of your action research paper. Yeah. Okay. All right, so next slide here, Dan. I guess I've spoken to this already. I will add to this. Um, so as Missy is going through this process and as our, our other students are going through this process and engaging in action research, which is sort of collecting data on the community and the needs of the community and the ch changes they're trying to facilitate and then actually doing research on the degree to which the things that the actions they take are having a difference in their communities. Um, instead of at the very end, um, again, doing a, a study and then writing a traditional five chapter thesis. Um, at this point, when you go through all your coursework and you do your action research, where at the end, you're, you are asked to create a product, but it's not a, necessarily a 200 page thesis. In fact, the product has to speak directly to the change you're trying to make. So it may be a presentation to the school committee, or it might be a proposal for a new program in a community college, or it may be a new professional development plan for organization. Um, or it might be a presentation at a national conference, or it might be a, 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 an article in a professional journal, or it might be a video documentary. The reality is that the final product is dependent on what is the kind of product that you can put out there in the world that could, could actually um, not only uh, serve as um, 
as a useful to the community you're serving, but in fact, it might speak to um, what is some insights that you've gained over the last several years that could be kind of useful to other communities as well. So that's a very big difference in the program. So Danny, go to the next slide. Ah, okay, now we get to the Seattle experience. So, so we have 1,600 doctoral students. Many of them, um, there are three, there are really two sets of programs. Um, the the Boston-based program, where most of our students enroll because they live in Iowa or South America or in the Northeast and so forth and so on, they will enroll in the program. and uh, I guess one of the things I should say now is that uh, one of the reasons we have 1,600 doctoral students is because it's enormously, enormously flexible for for these these are the individuals who are working full time, as I had mentioned before, and so you don't have your classes pretty much online, and Missy can speak to that later a little bit. But um, you do meet if you, you join the Boston-based program, you do come to Boston two different summers um, for two days each, um, so that you can actually meet face to face with fellow uh, with 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 faculty and fellow students because we do like want to have it not be completely online we want to have these two opportunities at least for our students uh, and faculty to meet with one another and to build those relationships um, the difference with the Seattle and the Charlotte based program is that in the Seattle program which we started about seven years ago I believe um, instead of waiting for the summer students enroll in the fall and then after the second or third week uh, in late September or early October they meet on campus together so this and, and then they do that again in November and then they do that again in January and again in March in the second quarter and the nice thing about it is that the students who are just enrolling into a doctoral program my experience has been that it's sort of a deer in the headlights sort of uh, response and say, oh my gosh, what did I just do? I'm in the doctoral program. Am I going to be successful? Can I really do it? And when we get into the same room, everybody is saying the same thing. And the faculty there are to say, look, you belong here. You're not an imposter. You can do this and we're going to make this work. And I think the students are able to connect with one another right away too. And, uh, and then and I think that makes a huge difference in both the Seattle-based and the Charlotte-based program. Um, Missy, you wanna to speak to that at all? Yeah, coming on the first uh, weekend, there was definitely some imposter syndrome and it was really encouraging to literally talk about it and, and the professor was letting us all know that we were all in the same boat and, and that we're in the right space and ever since that weekend that imposter syndrome has definitely gone away i just really appreciated that face-to-face -face time yeah so i i particularly like the seattle and the charlotte based program because of that difference right that you're able to meet face to face early on and really build you know build relations with the fellow students um and you know just to say seattle doesn't mean that everybody's from seattle so i've taught in that first quarter in the Seattle program for many years now. Um, and we have students flying in from Nevada, um, coming in from Idaho, Western Washington, Eugene, Oregon. I mean, they from, from a lot, even in California, some from LA. So in fact, anybody who enrolls in the program can participate in the Seattle-based program. You're not really beholden to exactly where you live. Um, I do remember uh, uh, one student early on in the first cohort in the Seattle program, who was uh, I always I always looked up and said, Sylvester, what are you doing here? Because he was flying in from Des Moines, and he said, Well, when I looked at the program, I decided I'd really rather visit Seattle than Boston. So there he was. There he was from Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> so, all right, let's go to the next slide. Oh, so Dan. Your cue. What what do you need to do to apply? <laughs> All right. So uh, the at the top you'll see two essays. Those are uh, one is a one thousand to twelve hundred word uh, statement uh, about your problem of practice. Uh, our panelists have already talked about that, but you are basically at that point 
laying out the, the problem that you see that you're going to be working on during uh, your residency and during your time in the program. Uh, the other is a 300 to 400 word statement that basically uh, you'll be talking to the admissions committee and saying, here is why I am uh, right for this program based on your uh, experiences of life uh, in your industry, um, uh, in your job experience. Uh, the transcripts, your, uh, transcripts are needed from both your undergrad and graduate programs. Uh, the, typically you can send in your unofficial transcripts and then once a person has, once a decision has been made, then uh, Northeastern will request, request your official transcripts and those can be sent. Uh, either, uh, you can mail those or, or upload those to a portal. Uh, the three recommendations, two are professional recommendations. Uh, you need people who can speak to your ability to do this high-level uh, postgraduate uh, work. Uh, and then the other recommendation, the third there, would be a faculty recommendation from your graduate uh, degree program, who, again, would be speaking to your ability to work at this level, and he or she would know your, your academic side the best, your academic uh, level. Uh, let's see, the due date, August 8th for fall admittance to the Seattle uh, campus. Uh, Chris has mentioned we're on a quarter system. The quarter in Seattle will start September 16th, uh, but you wouldn't, then that would just be the online portion, and then you would meet your cohort and Chris uh, that first weekend in uh, it's October 5th. Um, other than that, uh, it's a very simple. Uh, process to, to apply. There's an online application that you do, and it just basically walks you through it in places for you to upload or have your recommenders uh, upload their statements. Uh, back to our panelists. Great. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And oh, so we'll open the q and tonight. So if you could put any questions you might have for any of us in the chat box or question box, in the webinar, um, uh, do that now, and then Dan can read us the questions. Uh, but while the, you're doing that, I will want to say one other thing. That is, um, we are beginning to run um, what we call sort of scholar practitioner uh, change agent slash experiential learning conferences in, um, in association with our programs. So we run those in Boston in the summer. We do that um, in November in Charlotte, and we do that in Seattle in March. And so as a Seattle cohort um, participant, you would have two, two weekends in the fall that you meet with your fellow students and faculty, and you would have two weekends uh, in the winter. But that second weekend, which I think falls around March 14th or 15th, 13th, um, would be students flying in from across the country, if not uh, beyond, to be, participate in the, this, uh, this conference that we will hold. And I forget the exact two dates, but it's uh, like the second weekend in March. Um, so that's also really interesting that you, have, you would be, have a chance to meet face-to-face -face with uh, some uh, EDD students from across the, as again, across the country, if not beyond, uh, in Seattle. So, Dan, we got any questions? I don't see any questions. I did list my uh, contact information, email, and phone number for anyone who would like to get in touch with me offline or uh, after the, the webinar has ended. And you were correct, by the way, uh, that is March 14th is that last, uh, that March weekend. All right, great. So if you move to the next slide, we can get our contact information up. Um, again, we'll give people a couple, a couple more minutes. If they want to add anything to the chat back, any questions? The contact information is up here. And as people think about whether they have any other questions, I don't know whether Missy, you want to add any other comments about what it's been like for you, how it was different than you thought it might be, what's it like to be in the Seattle cohort? Um, the Seattle cohort cohort's been amazing. We um, we have done a lot of projects together. We get together often, whether it's digitally, like a webinar like this, or or face to face. 
So that's been really amazing. I didn't expect to build relationships with people. I thought I would kind of just be doing my research on my own. Um, another thing that um, I did want to share is everybody that's come to talk to us, other people that have been in the program longer have always said that this program really um, allows you still to have your family and to, um, you know, they're very understanding if you have something come up. I didn't believe that. I had an unexpected death uh, a month ago and while I was working on a project and I didn't think I could finish my project because of things that were happening that were out of my control. And my professor was so um, supportive and helpful that my stress level went down and I was able to finish my project that I was worried about not being able to finish. And I thought, wow, that was really above and beyond what I had expected. I had expected it to be, a, here's the work, do it, don't care about your circumstances. But um, it was really remarkable to have somebody take the time to support me when I needed it the most. And then I was still able to get the project done. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that uh, I'll add to that. Um, and people can still think about if they have any questions, but I'll add to say that, um, you know, there, there is a great deal of flexibility in the program. I mean, sometimes, um, well, in, in, I should say first that, you know, the normal pathway is for people to take two courses a quarter. And in fact, if you take two courses a quarter, you'll be done with all your coursework within the first 12 plus nine, 21 months. So within two years, and then you wrap up your action research over the following anywhere from six to 12 months. Um, so you can actually be done with the entire program in three years. But in reality, people um, are busy. Um, life happens. Um, some students decide that they need to take one, only one course a quarter. Um, sometimes something happens and they have to take a quarter off, which is completely fine, you know. So it's incredibly flexible in that, in that respect. Um, so I think that is another thing I should have mentioned is, um, any questions, Dan? Chris, there is a question and, and you've, you've sort of touched on it. What does a typical school week involve? Well, I'll have Missy answer that. <laughs> <laughs> that was my biggest concern and it was the one question I was afraid to ask. So good job asking that question. Um, a typical week, I will, I will share with you what I do and how I manage. I, I do get up at 4.30 in the morning, every morning, and I put two hours of homework time in, and then I start my school day as a teacher. So then I go and I teach all day. Then I come home and my son is in cross country and wrestling and other sports, so that gives me another two hours to work. So I am putting in about three to five hours a day wow. for, for the work. And then my weekends are pretty open. I get to spend my weekends with my family. So I choose to do that. I talk to other people who really just save most of it for nights when the kids go to bed and weekends. And that's how, how they do it. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of time and maybe I'm putting more time in. It takes me a long time to read and it takes me a long time to process. And that's just how my brain works, which I'm okay with. But um, it, it definitely, is a full day, but it's a, it's a rewarding day. I don't go to bed exhausted at the end of the day. I don't go to bed with a tired brain. I go to bed ignited for the work that I'm going to be doing the next day. That's great. Yeah, I think that people choose to, my experience, um, people choose to do it um, in a variety of ways, like, like Missy. Um, they either, I mean, I've, I've heard students basically decide that they're going to use their one hour lunchtime at work to do work. Um, some people decide Saturday morning is uh, school time and so the family knows from seven to noon not, not to bother uh, the mom or dad or whoever else it is. Um, some people choose to get up early and do a little work. Uh, some people choose to do some work on the weekends. I think it, the, the, the amount of time you spend is relative depending on what's going on in the class and what's expected because sometimes you're just reading or sometimes you're watching videos, sometimes you're creating presentations. Um, so, you know, uh, I think the average would be maybe, you know, three to five, maybe six hours a week per class, depending on what's going on. Um, 
So, um, and I do want to take this time real quick just to note also that while there is a lot of reading, um, many of us use um, uh, tools for asynchronous conversations. I personally use VoiceThread a lot. I actually have a class where there's no paper that people are quitting a website and that's how they're doing their, so there's a lot of innovative practices that are taking place. I have a lot of virtual conversations as well. So it's not all, all just text-based. And in fact, uh, you know, so it, I think many of us in the faculty are, are, are employing a lot of different tools um, some are even using Flipgrid, <laughs> um, so it, it will vary um, um, across uh, faculty and, and in the course. Let me stop and see if there are any other questions, Dan. Uh, no, there was one more about asynchronous, uh, or and then I answered that, and you did touch on it just on just uh, on cue. Yeah, yeah. Must I will say that most of it is we actually try to have as much asynchronous as possible. Partly not that synchronous is bad, but synchronous is hard when people are living in different parts of the country and have the work lives and families they have to identify like seven o'clock on a Tuesday night. Even though we do this from time to time, it's typically optional. And in, in my case, what I do is I will host virtual discussions, but I will actually, and people are, it's voluntary to join. And then I'll record it and post it online and people the rest of the week are able to watch and listen to the conversation. So there are a variety of ways to, to play it out, I guess. Any other questions, Dan? Uh, not that I'm seeing. Anyone else have a question that uh, we can answer for you? And uh, if you wanted a, a copy of this slide deck, just email me at uh, d.carney at northeastern.edu right there on the slide deck on this page right here, and I will uh, get that out to you. Um, and there's also other flyers and things and information on the Seattle website as well. That is correct. So. I don't see final. Anything. No, no more. Okay. Um, Missy, any uh, final words? Yeah, I love this program. I appreciate the way that it's set up. I, um, I'm not getting paid to be on this webinar. I'm doing this because <laughs> I feel like it's a really good program. And if you're considering a doctoral program, I highly recommend Northeastern. All right. Okay, so if anybody has any Wants to reach out to either Dan or myself. My information is on there too. I'm frequently on the phone with various people who are interested in the program and answering specific questions that they have. And uh, so please feel free to reach out to me um, and to Dan. And you know, uh, you know, hope hope that you consider joining us in the fall. Hey, Chris. Yeah. One more question, and I want to make sure yep. that we. How many courses are are required to be full time? Well, you have to do two courses a quarter to be full time, and that's actually a good question because to 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 uh, to be able to get financial aid, you have to take two, uh, be full time, and and this this is two quarter. This is two classes per quarter. So um, if you look at, if you go to the Northeastern website or the Seattle website uh, and look at the courses, there are typically, there are four, three, there are three introductory courses around what does it mean to be a scholar practitioner and what does it mean to be an EDD student and uh, how do we think about being a change agent and uh, then also you're taking over the year and three quarters or two years, um, you're taking a series of four research courses, which basically step you through the process of doing your own action research. Um, so it's not like studying research for the sake of studying research. It's really actually uh, a, a place and space for you to develop your own action research. Then you have um, the differences, uh, difference then would be dependent on your concentration so if you're in either, any of the three concentrations, they have different requirements for four or five courses in that concentration. Um, and then you take, I think it's uh, four electives. Now, having said that, um, 
you can transfer in three courses from your master's program. Um, you can submit that to our um, program advisor who will review it with you. And most students do this. And so, Missy, if you haven't, you need to do this. <laughs> I've done <laughs> you know, it. <laughs> okay, you've done it, right? Because yes. basically it saves you three courses and that, that much more money as well and time. Um, so you can actually, so I think if I get it right, it's a total of, if you have the three transferred in, I think it's a total of 13 courses over the first uh, 19 months. That is correct. And so, yes, yeah, so if you get those, those three courses waived uh, because you've already taken uh, something very similar, then that would get knock off nine quarter hours that you don't have to, uh, to deal with. And I bet Missy right. can attest to how nice that is. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, right. financially and time-wise, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The big two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Fantastic. Okay, everyone, you have till August 5th, uh, but I'll be here between now and then. Chris, of course, is also available. So uh, let me know what I, what I can do for you, and let's uh, get you started on becoming a change agent. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Missy, and uh, thank, you. thank you for joining us. Take care.